great. Thanks, Jay. And hi, everybody. I am starting to see some faces I recognize now in these sessions. So thanks very much to those of you that have that have come back to to a few of these. And if this is your, your first one of the sort of lacunos smile workshops, welcome. Um, so I'm excited to be talking with you all today about sort of one of the newer concepts that we're trying to work into this work with you all. And it's called semantic waving. And I'm guessing this is probably an idea that is going to be new for folks. It's, it's still pretty new for me. I ran across this concept a couple of years ago and it really resonated with me in sort of the ways I was trying to think about bringing together language and science learning. And so I want to share about this sort of model with you all and get your feedback on it. Now, the good news is, is even though it's different and new, it is also related to things that we think about. It's not so far out there that it's, you know, we're going to have ways to sort of conceptually hook it to things that we do know. And so really, I'm interested, I'm going to present and share a little bit about what it is and what I think it's good for, but then really looking forward to chatting as a group about how this connects and feels similar to things maybe you're already doing and or sort of what new ideas it gives you. So here we go. Uh, next slide. So, so most of you are probably familiar now that this project is called Lacunos and Lacunos has three sort of different strands or pillars. And each of those pillars has some practices, some instructional practices that we'll be talking about and working with you all over the next few years and thinking about how we sort of take up these practices and, and put them to use in our different contexts. And the three pillars, of course, are language development, particularly what is it about scientific language that is both challenging for students, but also powerful. And how do we help students sort of gain the power that comes from scientific language? The cultural component is all about making connections back and forth between what kids are learning in school and what their interests, experiences, and backgrounds are outside of school. And then the knowledge building pillar is all about how we help students put together sort of bits and pieces of knowledge into coherent sort of knowledge frameworks or storylines about how the world works. Um, semantic waving really connects with the language pillar. And so we're gonna be focused back again today kind of on language and the language of science and how semantic waving as an instructional strategy might help our students make sense of that language of science. Um, I did wanna point out on this slide and on the, we've got a new logo. So showing off our new logo. So I'm very happy with the logo for language, culture, knowledge and science. And if you go to the next slide, um, we have versions of the logo like this one that highlights and we're gonna use the sort of logo that calls out language or culture or knowledge in our different handouts and model lessons just as sort of a visual cue that here's an area where we're gonna sort of be focusing on language or culture. Anyway, so today we're focused on language um, and to get us started, just thinking a little bit about the language of science and why it sounds the way it does and everybody can sort of pick out scientific language when we hear it. Kids are very good at sort of discerning, oh, that language is science, right? So there's things about the language of science that really stand out that, that make it very distinct and also potentially make it alienating or confusing. But really, of course, the language of science evolved for particular purposes, and that purpose isn't to confuse kids, even though it sometimes may feel that way for them. It actually evolved for very good reasons, but a byproduct of that evolution is for outsiders who are trying to come into the community of science, it can feel kind of alienating, right? But it evolved particularly to do two types of things, because science and the language that describes science is pretty technical. There's a lot of technical specificity that goes into learning science and practicing science. And so there's, an, there's, an, there's a nature of technicality to the language of science that is part of why it sounds the way it does. But there's other things that are technical, that sound technical, that don't sound like science. So it isn't just that it's technical, but the technical part of the language of science 
often is at the word level. It comes from the vocabulary. That's why it sounds technical is we have these very sort of complex technical words and the words are always changing and evolving. So we've got words like bioinformatics or neuroparasitology that wouldn't have been in a textbook. I saw those both in a high school science textbook recently. Um, those wouldn't have been in a high school science textbook a few years or decades ago, but they are now. So more and more and more technical vocabulary, right? But also this idea that the language of science is about a type of reasoning or type of scientific argument that is very logical and rational. And that sort of argument, the language of that reasoning, the language of that argument is not so much found in the, at the word level. It's not so much about the vocabulary. It's actually at the grammatical level of sentence structure. And that is where kind of certain types of sentences that provide the sort of the normal language of scientific argument, it's more subtle. And so when we think as teachers about teaching kids the language of science, we often focus on vocabulary because it's the more obvious place to go and it's that technical piece. But we also need to be thinking about that rationality, that argumentative piece, and that's a more subtle type of language. So we need to think in a little more depth about the language of science. Next slide, Jane. So um, Michael Halliday is a linguist who, who I like his work about this a lot. Um, and he basically talks about the language of science as actually having three main types of features. And so technical vocabulary usage definitely is one of those, right? So I'm, I'm not at all saying we shouldn't be spending time teaching science vocabulary. We do need to do that because that is how we help kids build up the technical side of that language. But we also need to think about this idea of the gr grammar, the language structure. And what Halliday found is the language of science often, and if you think about it, you've experienced this, it's often in passive voice. And actually what happens is things that are verbs or adjectives get turned into abstract nouns to give them more permanence so that we can like study them better. So we could think about the weather here in Oregon and we could say it's raining today. So raining is a verb and that's temporary and that's gonna go away, right? So we could say it's rainy in the PNW and then rainy is an adjective, right? It's describing the weather and that's a little more permanent. It's like rainy, but scientifically we could make it even sort of more kind of abstract and permanent by saying we've got a wet winter subtropical climate. So that is taking what was a verb and then an adjective and it's making it into an abstract noun, a type of climate. And similarly, the examples here on the slide, we move becomes motion and eroding surfaces become surface erosion. So the language of science is full of taking these actions and turning them into abstract nouns. And again, the reason is so we can then put them in taxonomies and work with them in the way the scientists work with ideas. And to do that, it has to sort of have this more sort of permanent structure. But what that does is it makes it feel like people aren't involved. So there's a lot of passive voice in science. So instead of saying that, you know, I took an ice core and I found that the CO2 content in the air is 20% lower, was 20% lower 200 years ago than it is now. We say ice cores were taken and CO2 content was found to be 20% lower. Right? That sounds more sciencey. It sounds more scientific. But what we did is we took out the actor. We took out who was doing the action and we turned it into passive voice, like things were done and things were found, but it doesn't say who did the doing and who did the finding, right? And so that is, in terms of how it evolved that way, it's meant to make it seem objective. And like, there's no real problem with that. If you're an insider in the science community, that's just how you learn to write and to communicate. But if you're an outsider trying to learn this culture and community, that feels like distant and maybe uninviting. Like where are the people who are doing these things? And so this idea that we need to sort of help students think about how that language got put together in certain ways is important. And then finally, the idea that Halliday calls lexical density, that the other thing that science language does is it takes a lot of ideas and it sticks them together into short phrases that are just chocked full of a lot of information. And that's a shortcut that once you know all the code, right, once you know the terms, then that's just an efficient way to talk. But as a learner, there's so many ideas sometimes packed into a short phrase 
that you just can't really make sense of it. There's too much in there. So we need to help kids be able to sort of unpack those dense phrases. And that's really what semantic waving is about, unpacking and then repacking ideas. Next slide. Um, so briefly, how, how sort of I got to this, and these are some ideas that over time we'll be thinking about in some other workshops, but sort of how our understanding of the language of science has changed over time. So when I was in school, I read Jim Cummins and the idea of Bix and Kalp, basic interpersonal communication skills and cognitive academic language proficiency, this idea that there's academic language and there's social language and kids get comfortable with social language first and they need to learn academic language. But that idea is, is pretty outdated. And in fact, it's messier than that. And particularly this idea that academic language, there may not be this like general academic language. So other linguists like Mary Schleppigrell talk about how we really need to talk about what's distinctive about each discipline. So how is the language of science different than the language of history, different from the language of math? And the implication of this, of course, is if they're distinct discourses, then only a science teacher can really be prepared to teach the language of science. You can't rely, we can't rely on our language arts colleagues to do this because you need the content knowledge, you need the disciplinary experiences to be able to really sort of help people understand the language that goes along with it. And so we, we as science teachers are kind of on the hook for being the ones who teach our kids about the language of science because we're the only ones who really can do it. Um, George Bunch, who is a, another sort of science and social studies person that I like a lot, he talks about the distinction between the language of ideas and the language of display. So as we're learning something new and it's messy and we're trying to understand it, we shouldn't worry too much if our language is perfect because we're really trying to be focused on the ideas. But there comes some point at the end, we're putting together our lab notebook or we're putting together a report or we're putting together a presentation where then like we need to think about the language of display. How are we gonna explain the ideas using kind of more formal language that, that presents us as knowing what we're talking about. But we shouldn't worry about that when we're doing the messy part. Messy language is fine when we're doing the messy thinking. And that the connection to science I see there is it's very similar. Bruno Latour and others talk about this difference between science and the making, like what's actually happening in labs when scientists are doing their work, and then how it gets presented in journal articles and public discourse. And the settled science feels very neat and clean and tidy, but science in the making we know is messy and full of mistakes and arguments and disagreements. And one is not a truer representation of science than the other, but when we represent it only as this neat, tidy final package, we are not rec representing correctly the idea that it's much messier than that when it's, when it's being made. So all these ideas are helpful, have been helpful to me as I've thought about teaching the language of science, but they're all binaries. They're all like, it's this or this. It's general academic or it's discipline specific. It's language of ideas or it's language of display. It's science in the making or it's settled science. What I like about the idea of semantic waving is that it's actually about a continuum. It sees these things as a continuum rather than as binaries. And I think that's a more useful way to think about it. Um, the quote on the right side of the slide here, I pulled this out of just a random science journal article that I opened. Of, of special note are three phylotypes of archaea, a, dom a domain of life often found in extreme environments and not previously reported from human skin. So just taking just a random sample of scientific language, you can see that there is both technicality there, there's some odd words, but also there's a grammatical structure that is not the typical structure that kids are learning to sort of read and write with in school. So that just the idea that we need to think about with our students scientific language in some different ways if we want them to really take ownership of it. That's what we really want. We want them to own this language. So that brings us to semantic waving. Next slide, Jay. So, so what is semantic waving? So in a nutshell, semantic waving is basically this idea that if you sort of look up at the top, it says abstract concept. Oh, sorry, it's a little hard to read in the diagram, but up, 
on the top of the diagram, it says abstract concepts in technical language, what we're trying to explain. And so often we find ourselves as science teachers with this kind of dense technical idea and language that we want our students to understand. Um, and some teachers, and this happens a lot at university, they just stay up there at the abstract technical. Everything's abstract and technical and some kids do fine with that, right? But other kids just are not gonna get it. And so we need to do something more than just stay at abstract and technical. So K-12 teachers, you know, we, we, we understand this a little better maybe than university professors. And we recognize that we have to give concrete examples and use metaphors and bring in some everyday language and some everyday things as examples of this kind of abstract and technical idea. However, where sometimes we fall short is we go down that wave, we go from the abstract and technical and we unpack it and we make it concrete and we try to bring in some simple examples and some simpler language and some metaphors and some visuals. But sometimes we stop there and we don't push back up. Why it's a wave is we then need to push back up the other side and get back to the abstract and technical. We can't kind of leave it. If we leave it there with the concrete everyday examples, kids may understand the concept, but they're not then going to sort of be able to explain it back using the language of science. They may be able to get it and explain it back in everyday terms, and that may be, that's great. That's a great sort of stepping stone along the way, but we can't be satisfied with that. In the end, we want them to be able to take ownership of the scientific language, A, because that is going to help them be seen as a science person. It's gonna help them see themselves as a science person, but it is also you know, going to help them demonstrate to others that they understand the science in, in a deeper way. Um, and this, this idea actually came from research in Australia that was done with science and history teachers. So even though this is kind of theoretical concept, it comes from a very practical space of watching teachers who were known for helping their students have high learning gains. And so really looking at these teachers who their kids were performing very well on Australia's tests and sort of saying, what are, what, is there any, what's common about their practice? And this is one of the things that these researchers found was common in these teachers' practices was that they were always looking to unpack things, but then repack and make them complex and abstract and technical again. And they were constantly doing this waving. So next slide. So here's just sort of another example of, of what this might look like. So, so we can think about, so this is sort of thinking, using the idea of semantic waving to study semantic waving, if that makes sense. I was thinking about, does that make sense? So like it's kind of an abstract and technical idea to say that semantic waves are discourse profiles that kind of illustrate a process of moving between abstract dense language and concrete less dense language. So that's kind of an abstract idea. So, you know, as an example, this wave is from a lesson where a math teacher was talking, or computer science teacher was talking about algorithms and how algorithms are precise sequences or steps that we use to perform some sort of data processing, right? And that's very abstract. So how can we sort of have a, how can we unpack that and use a concrete example? Well, this teacher said, algorithms are like recipes. And basically, you know, just like following the directions in a recipe, if you follow the directions in the recipe correctly, you're gonna get the right kind of cake. And if you mess up the recipe, don't do the steps right, it's going to not work out. And that algorithms are pretty much the same way, that if you follow all the steps exactly, it should work exactly right. And if you make a mistake somewhere, it's not, the cake is not going to come out. But rather than stopping there, then you have to, push back up the wave. And so one of the ways to do that is then distinguish, okay, well, how is a recipe actually not like an algorithm? Because, you know, they're not quite, it's like metaphors always run out of explanatory purpose. And so this idea that an algorithm is like a recipe, but actually, you know, the difference is that the algorithm, we can't really change it or it breaks down. In recipes, we can tinker, like maybe it comes out better. We, we substitute one thing with something else and maybe it tastes better. But for a computer algorithm, it doesn't really work that way. So pointing out sort of the limitations 
of the metaphor, the limitations of the example is one way to help bring the idea back sort of to the complex and technical level. And that's kind of by elaborating and, and refining the meanings. Okay, um, so that is in a nutshell what, what semantic waving is about. And now we're gonna do a breakout. And after the breakout, we'll do a model activity, which hopefully will look for some more examples of how we see semantic waving in, in the model activity. But first we want to either break out or, or whole group chat about these questions. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering sort of you know, like, hopefully these ideas resonate with some things that you already do because you know, you're already doing lots of things to try to take complex ideas and make them comprehensible to your students. So I'm curious sort of you know, what those things are. How do you already think about this? And then does, any, does anything that you do do, does it have any of this aspect that reminded you as I was talking about semantic waving, is there anything in what you do that you feel like gets at some of this already? And then third question, maybe what new ideas did this give you or what are you thinking now based on our conversation so far? And that is what we're gonna chat about. And so I do have breakouts for us. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any general questions on um, semantic waving before we go into the breakouts that somebody would like to ask um, at the whole group level. Um, because this, I think it is a new concept for, for many of us and I'm definitely learning a lot here. Um, any, any specific questions before we go into the breakouts? With that, I'm going to, if there's no questions, um, and I don't see any in the chat either, um, I'm going to send us into the, the breakouts for about um, 16, 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah, sorry, I went a little long there. 15 minutes is good for breakout. And um, so we'll, we'll see you back here. But before we go, um, there is a Google Doc, which um, we encourage everybody to take notes on. I'm going to put that into the chat. Um, feel free to open that up and this will allow us to take notes. Now it's, it's sort of sectioned off as elementary and in high school, we're not going to have, or elementary, middle and high school, we're not going to have that. We're just going to have group one and two. So if you're, um, if you're in room one, you're going to be on page one. And if you're room two, you're going to be on page two. So we'll see you in about, uh, 15 minutes. Thanks. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we, we had a great conversation in group one. I hope group two had a, had a good conversation, too. Um, lots of natural connections, as, as, as I knew there would be. You know, the, there's, there's plenty that every, every good educator is already doing that, that connects to this, but that this framework perhaps lets us see what we're doing in a new light or provide some insight into into sort of why we might be doing some of the things we're doing and what some of the benefits might be. Um, a really interesting thing we talked about in our conversation was how the wave that you imagine using may differ e even for the same lesson, depending on sort of the class and the students and what you know about the kids, that there wouldn't be like one sort of ideal way to have a wave to think about teaching a certain topic that of course it's also connected to what you know about your students. And so doing this well is partly sort of understanding what's gonna be challenging in general for kids, but then also thinking specifically about your kids, what's gonna be challenging for them. And if this is a way to sort of help, help bring some clarity. Um, so anyway, um, let's talk about the model activity that, that we've got for you, which is, it's about osmosis. And I sort of like osmosis because it can be relevant for biology, uh, life science, but it can also be relevant for chemistry. Um, and there's lots, of course, of labs and investigations around osmosis. Um, this is a particularly fun one. And again, I've learned that a lot of these sort of activities are common activities that a lot of people know about, um, but maybe just presenting them in a slightly different way with a slightly different emphasis. Um, so, so yeah, um, so there's a handout that goes with this and like mo and, and we're going to use this model activity to think about semantic waving, of course, but it is also just a good 
a good fun activity to do to help kids understand osmosis. Um, and so like most, like all the model lessons that we've shared so far, they always start with what we call a language booster. And again, a language booster is to bring some of the ideas and concepts, but hopefully to connect it, connect the science idea to some real world experience maybe kids have had experience with or just something more concrete that they may have experienced. And so this is framing osmosis around kind of the question, do fish drink water? And I I've, I've remember one of my sons asking me this question when he was little, do fish drink water? Um, there's some books for kids about do fish drink water? And of course the answer is some fish drink water and some don't. And it depends on if they're freshwater fish or saltwater fish, because it's related to trying to keep some homeostasis of the salt content in the fish's body. And so fish that are living in fresh water, you know, have, have more, you know, have, have more salt in their bodies than they than there is outside. And so they, you know, bring water in, but saltwater fish who have more salt in the outside water, you know, than in their bodies, you know, need need to not let in too much of the salt. And so so it's sort of different. So it's a question about osmosis, but it's related to, you know, maybe a way that, you know, something a, 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 concrete question that maybe kids kids might be interested in. Um, and so that's the language booster. And then it asks them to sort of, there's always some reflection questions asking them to sort of make some connections to the real world. So in this case, if a person gets dehydrated on a hot day, what do you think happens to the salt levels in their cells? Um, so again, thinking about osmosis, but in a sort of concrete way so it's but but it's sort of you know it's concrete in that it's talking about fish but it's abstract in that the question do fish drink water is not kind of a, a normal question to ask right um so doing the gummy bear osmosis lab is a way hopefully to help kids understand something about osmosis and then maybe be able by the end to know a little bit more about about why fish might or might not drink water um, and so all of our sort of model lessons, they start with a little bit more background about the concept. They are hopefully, and we're making them more, we're adding more visuals and interactive stuff. Of course, we want them to be multimodal, to have lots of kind of rich, rich visuals. Um, we also highlight or italic certain words in the language booster, and you're gonna see those show up at the end in, in, in the word cards. Um, and then in this case, the actual gummy bear lab, some of, some of you probably know it, but basically you're taking gummy bears. So gummy bears are pretty cool because unlike most candy, so most candy dissolves in water. And so sometimes like as a pre-lab for this, you can get some different kinds of candies and just leave them in water overnight. And you'll see that most sugary candies totally dissolve or mostly dissolve over water. But Gummy bears, because they're made with gelatin, actually don't dissolve in water. They behave very differently. And in the process of making gummy bears, um, water is actually extracted. So it's, you know, it's sugar and the collagen and water, and it forms a gelatin when they cook it and it cools, you know, pour it in molds and it cools, and water is removed during that process. And so gummy bears actually have very low water content when they're kind of in their normal gummy bear, a little gummy bear form, but they, because they're gelatin, instead of dissolving in water, they actually demonstrate osmosis really well. And so basically you're putting gummy bears in this activity in different solutions. So pure water, distilled water, and then salt water, and then vinegar, and sort of sugar water, and then baking soda water. And so partly this is, you know, depending on your kids and your age and their experience with sort of procedures, this is a nice one with a fair amount of measurement. So I've done this with elementary, where the emphasis is really on learning to do just a, an opportunity to practice measurement. And then with middle school, it can be more about introducing osmosis. And then I've seen high school teachers do this kind of as an introduction to osmosis, where of course you're gonna go deeper, but this might, might be a nice way to introduce it. Um, 
So if you keep scrolling down, basically you start by taking some measurements of the bears before you soak them in water and you just measure the length, the width, the depth, the weight, and then you're gonna put them in the different solutions and let them soak. And there's a couple of versions of this. You can check them after one day, you know, if you, you know, if you can, it's kind of fun to look at them after 24 hours and then look again after 48 hours, um, or you can just, take them out after 24 or 48. By 72 hours, they start to break down. Um, so you can let them keep going, but eventually the gelatin will, will start to break down. Um, but what you find when you, and so then the next table, there's a lot of opportunity for kids to sort of practice sort of ob observing and they, there's opportunity to measure, but also to take some descriptive observation and sort of look and compare. Um, and so they all behave a little bit differently. What you find, and it's going to be hard to demonstrate, but the gummy bears that are in plain distilled water get really giant. They grow by like maybe five times or more of their size. You probably can't see, but I've got a regular gummy bear, and then I've got a big old giant gummy bear that's going to fall apart when I pick them up. Uh, I've got another one floating in my water, but in, in regular water, of course, they, they grow a lot because there is way less water in the gummy bear than in the water. And so it, gummy bear functions as a semi-permeable membrane. And so you get a lot of osmosis in water. Um, other things that are water solutions like vinegar or sugar water, they will grow, but not quite as much as in pure water. And then salt does something curious, right? Salt, it actually shrinks. So it's the only case in which my gummy bear after soaking because of osmosis is actually smaller than my gummy bear pre-soaking. So that's kind of the oddball. Um, so yeah, so they describe sort of what the effect of the solution after it soaks overnight, and then they can either in the next page, come back and either take, take another set of measurements after one day or two days, and then trying to think about anything they, either they can describe some more or start to try to explain a little bit about why the gummy bears might, might be growing or in the case of the salt water shrinking. And all of this is pretty concrete. So hopefully thinking about this in terms of semantic waving, we started with something fairly sort of abstract in the language booster. And then we're doing some very concrete hands on. Um, the, the Australians like to, to say un, unplugged investigations, which they mean hands on, that, that so much is on computers that they say, this is an unplugged lab, no, no technology needed, uh, except maybe a little digital scale. Um, and then to sort of reflect on, on what they were seeing and then to summarize and then sort of push back up the wave, we're trying to sort of connect back to our initial question. So thinking about what are the causes and effects that we saw and how does this demonstrate osmosis, but then getting back to the idea of, okay, does this actually help us think about the question, do fish drink water? And we always end with trying to answer our, whatever our final question is in a couple different ways. One way that would be using simpler language. So a lot of times we'll ask it like explain this so a third grader could understand it. Um, and then another way to say the same thing, but using language that your teacher might use, or how would you explain it to a visiting scientist or something, but the idea that we're trying to get, get kids to take the idea and be able to use different language to communicate the same idea for different purposes or, or in different ways. And then finally, as we always have some of the key concepts turned into these sort of bilingual concept cards with images and kid-friendly definitions and used in a sentence. So we've got the standard ones for osmosis, concentration and diffusion and osmosis and semi-permeable membrane, selectively permeable membrane and polymer. Um, so, um, and solvent. So hopefully this activity potentially could be used for a couple of different things. It obviously can be used to help kids think about osmosis. It can be used to sort of think about measurement for younger kids. And it certainly can 
for me, helped me sort of think about how do we structure a lesson with semantic waving in mind? Are we thinking about going back and forth from sort of abstract to concrete and back? Or as we said in our group discussion, you might start the other way around. And sometimes we start with the concrete, but that it's this idea of looking for ways to wave back and forth between the dense and theoretical and then the concrete and, and more everyday and how going back and forth hopefully helps kids to recognize. I mean, we want kids to recognize that the language of science and scientific thinking isn't always stuck in this really technical level, right? When you, when you look at how scientists talk about their work, it isn't always only in the super technical dense, you know, we don't, we don't talk like, um, we don't really talk the same way as, as textbooks, right? This idea that scientists. So, we, so mm -hmm. we have a question um, from the chat. It says, why does the salt cause shrinking but vinegar does not? What about other ionic compounds such as copper sulfate? That, that is a really good question. I was, I was actually thinking just, just before we started that in, in some ways, like, you know, why, you know, salt is really, is really different than, than sugar, right? Because you know, homeostasis and with, with a sugar compound, you're basically saying there is more water, you know, when you've got sugar water, there's a less concentration of water in the sugar water than there is in pure water, right? So it's going to move to, to have equilibrium, but, but salt really, so you, you, you would think then that, that salt would, would act in the same way, but it, but it doesn't. So, so that, that is, that is kind of curious. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else knows, cause I'll, I'll have to do a little homework. Cause I was like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I will have to have to get back to you. And I wonder about, yeah, I wonder about something like copper sulfate. I'm going to defer to Julie on this. I figure the sugar in the gummy bear is higher in concentration than the sugar in the sugar water. Um, but the salt in the gummy bear is Must be less. lower in concentration than the salt in the salt water. But there's no vinegar in the gummy bear. <laughs> right, right, right. right. I'm confused. Yeah. I don't think there is. No, it, no, they're they're because it's not ionic, or is yeah. there something else going on? What does Julie tell us? Julie's probably done this experiment. <laughs> I haven't done the gummy bear one, Kim. I use my I just I use my egg. We dissolve the membrane. Mm, the shell of egg, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I, I appreciate the question and I will get back to you with an answer because I don't know. And that's a fun thing where these lessons generate new questions that you didn't initially anticipate. That's, that's the excitement about teaching yeah. um, live with students, right? As they, yeah. they're always gonna come up with questions and, and at some point that's what we do in science is say, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to study that. And we can find out together. My, my standard answer to kids is, I don't know, but let's find out, right? Yeah. So, but yeah. So any other, any other questions um, about this lesson? You know, we are going to be providing, as, as you've gotten two boxes, you're going to get a third box and it will have these materials in it. Right now, we're sort of uh, determining what materials we need to, to purchase for this lesson and um, the lesson in the next Lacunos PD, which will be coming up on March 2nd, but that will be all included in um, the next box. Yeah, and so I'm curious if, um, if there's any new ideas that people are taking away from the workshop today, any sort of new thought or new thing you wanna try or just new way that you're reflecting on anything? as we wrap up. Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. 
All right. Well, if not, we are we are certainly having fun sort of working on these model lessons and and sort of coming up with ones that we think will will be engaging for smile clubs, but we are always looking for feedback on how to um, do them, you know, just make them more useful for you all. So any, you know, any, any feedback you have on sort of structure of model lessons or, you know, topics, but also just sort of how we're doing them because the, the purpose is to make them useful for folks. So any, any feedback on that is, is more than welcome. And, and thank you for the, the comments in the chat. Um, and I, I have one follow-up question. It says, I will share the concept of semantic waving, I think emphasizing, and, and you're thinking about emphasizing the idea of going from more theoretical scientific language to concrete and back again with the students. Is, is that your thought? Finished after Julie's text. A minor oh, oh. Vocabulary. It was, okay. was interrupted. <laughs> I see it, I see it. Sorry, sorry, I missed that. I didn't scroll down. Um, so before we go, I just want to remind um, folks what's coming up. Uh, the first thing that we have coming up is uh, signing up for upcoming listening sessions. So part of um, what these Lucunos PDs are doing is, is really providing um, the overview of some of the main concepts that we'll be building off of in the next couple of years. Uh, the listening sessions or focus groups are, are going to be more focused on how do we actually do the things that we're setting out to do with you as teachers, your students, and your clubs, and ideally your communities, right? That's going to be another big part of this project is integrating um, families into this through uh, Family Math and Science Nights, which we already do, but we're going to sort of um, take those to the the next level, um, so to speak. Um, so we want to get your thoughts on that. So as we begin planning this summer, um, we we know um, what is going to work best for you. So that's those um, listening sessions. I do have many of you have already signed up. We're sort of full up. I'm I'm putting the link to the sign up in the chat. If you haven't signed up before. Um, we're pretty full up for February 16th, but if that's the only date that works for you, um, uh, that's great, and we can put you in. Um, but we do have a lot of slots on Tuesday, February 23rd, and Tuesday, March 9th. Um, so if you haven't signed up, feel free to do it then. And I will be sending a um, reminder email to those who signed up on the 16th um, later this week with a Zoom link. Um, and we have professional development pretty much every week. Next week is going to be systems thinking. Um, we have a group of industrial manufacturing engineering students who are creating a, uh, a lesson using systems thinking to come up with the grocery store of the future. As you know, one of the most dangerous things you can do during COVID is go to the grocery store, but it's mm. something everybody has to do. So how can students be thinking about the grocery store of the future based on not only the current pandemic, but specific shopper needs? Um, so that's coming up next week. The next Lacunos um, PD on autonomy touring is March 2nd, uh, 4 p.m. And we are now past five o'clock. So I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much, Corey, um, for the presentation. And if anybody has any specific questions, I will be here um, uh, to answer them. But again, thank you very much for spending your afternoon, evening with us. And uh, we will see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.